So for fluids, what I want to start off with is some basics. These you may or may not have seen um, in other classes. Uh, sometimes they could do them in chemistry or, or, uh, or just general science. Uh, so let me just mention, first of all, density. Density, we use the Greek letter rho. It looks like a rounded off P. And what density is defined as is the object's mass over its volume. So the units of it for us would be mass is in kilograms and volume is in meters cubed. So units of density are kilograms per cubic meter. The reason why you want to define this quantity is that this is often a nice way of characterizing materials. Um, so if you know something's density, you often can make some inferences to what it's made out of. So let's talk about um, solids, liquids, and gases. So these are, of course, three uh, typical types of uh, phases of matter. Let's do an example of a gas. For instance, the density of air in this room is about 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed, but that is just happens to be the density that it is um, at the moment. That's highly negotiable. For instance, if you took a bunch of air and you put it into a box and then you compress the box, of course the mass of those gas molecules in total is still the same, but you have them in a much smaller volume. So what have you done to the density? Increasing, exactly. So same mass over a smaller volume is a larger density. And so while a gas might have a particular density at a particular moment, it's highly negotiable. And for that reason, we call gases compressible. which means that their density is negotiable. Now if we go over to solids, let's take an example of a solid like gold. The density of gold is about over 19,000 kilograms per meter cube. That is extremely dense. It's more dense than lead. If you ever picked up a lead brick, um, you can appreciate that. In many movies where you see a bank robber carrying a bag full of gold bars out of the gold out of a vault, that's impossible. Okay? Gold is extremely dense, so it has a lot of mass and a small volume. Now, it hopefully isn't surprising that with a gold bar, you can't take it and smush into a smaller space. Um, at least with your bare hands or not. Um, and in fact, you need an extremely, extremely powerful compactor to even change its uh, volume by the tiniest percent. To a large degree of approximation, we call solids incompressible. Their density is not negotiable, and that's why it's useful for identification of what something is made out of. Because oftentimes materials have a certain characteristic density that you can't change. One of the, when you guys do your fluids lab, you'll actually use density as a means of identifying something's composition. Now, <clears throat> liquids, in a certain sense, have a foot in both camps. So for instance, water, this is fresh water, has a density of about 1,000 kilograms per meter cube. In chemistry, you might use different units. It's almost exactly one cubic centimeter but of course we stick to SI units in this class. Now, liquids and gases, we both think of them both as being able to flow, right? So for the purposes of fluids, we're gonna think of both liquids and gases as our fluids. We're gonna address them both as things that can flow. However, liquid, 
is incompressible to a very high degree of approximation. Now, if you need evidence of that, go to the supermarket, go down the soda aisle, grab one of those two-liter bottles of soda. Okay? That thing is hard as a rock, right? If you hit someone with that, it would really hurt. And it has nothing to do with the container, because if, once you drink all that soda, you usually crush it and throw it in the recycling. It's because of the fluid. The fluid cannot occupy any less space than it already is in. Its density is non-negotiable. Now, yes, you can change it ever so slightly, but for our purposes, it's basically its density is non-negotiable. For our purposes, the density of water at the bottom of the Marianas Trench in the ocean is basically the same density as it is on the surface. The density is not negotiable. Okay? So our fluids actually split up into two categories. Liquids are incompressible fluids. That's going to be the easiest to tackle and is going to be our focus. Liquids is what we're going to mostly look at. And then air, or any kind of gas, we consider it a compressible fluid, and there we start to talk more conceptually because it's really annoying that the density might change out from underneath you. Okay? So um, hopefully this um, shows you how liquids are kind of in, have a foot in both camps. They're incompressible like solids, but they also can flow, so they're fluids like gases. Okay? Um, any questions so far? Yeah? What if you have something like dust or something like an extremely fine dust? Mm -hmm. Isn't that kind of like fluid too? Yeah, but well, it's it's still a solid, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean these are categories that are uh, you know rough categories. Um, I don't know that you would necessarily um, talk about uh, you know you could talk about a dust particle as a solid, but you couldn't necessarily say that dust flying in the air. I mean that's dust particles mixed with a bunch of air molecules. So then you're really talking about the fact that it's more, mostly a gas, right? Um, so the next basics uh, kind of thing, hopefully you've seen density in some regard, um, is pressure. So pressure is defined as the force per area. So not just force, but how much force is applied per area. The units of pressure for us What's the units of force that we use? Newtons. Newtons, and how about area? Meters squared. Square meters, or meters squared. So it's measured in Newtons per meter squared. That does get an abbreviation, it's called a Pascal, PA for short. So Pascals are SI units for pressure. Pressure seems to be one of these things that there's a lot of units for it. Um, other units that you may, um, be aware of. So first of all, the air pressure, uh, this is atmospheric pressure at sea level. The pressure here is, where, right where we are, is 1.013 times 10 to the fifth pascals, roughly speaking, which is rounding off some of that extra is about 100,000 pascals. There are 100,000 newtons of force acting per square meter of your body. Okay. Now, what is the surface area of your skin? Well, your surface uh, depends obviously on the individual person, but roughly speaking, the area of your body that's exposed to the outside world is around one square meter. Which means that for that, such a person, there is 100,000 newtons of force pushing in on you. Doesn't that hurt? Well, you're used to it, right? Because while we happen to live on the surface of the ocean, we, also bottom, we are also bottom dwellers on the ocean of air that is surrounding our planet, which we call the atmosphere. So we're used to living on the bottom of that. In fact, you have a lot of severe health problems should you be jumping out of a spacecraft in deep space, because on a cellular level, you are built to resist this 100,000 newtons of force and your body doesn't know to not resist it when there is no such thing. So you can have, for instance, if you jumped out of a spacecraft with a lung full of air, that air would push out and you would uh, not explode, but just die. Okay? Um, that's if the extreme cold didn't get you first, right? Um, so, 
That's one unit of pressure, that's the SI units. Another non-SI unit, we can talk about it as one atmosphere, right? If you're going to make some scale that's tailor-made for humans, why not call where we live one, right? It's very kind of egocentric, but also useful, okay? Another uh, unit that you may have seen is millimeters of mercury, or sometimes it's called a tor. That's basically, um, uh, if you have a barometer which measures pressure, that's the how tall is the column of mercury that can be held up against a vacuum. So it turns out to be about 760 millimeters. And HG is mercury, right? Other things that you see, instead of using newtons, does anyone remember what the English system unit is for force? Uh, for newtons itself? Pounds, right? And then instead of uh, meters, they use inches. So pounds per square inch, sometimes abbreviated as pounds per square inch, PSI. Okay, so these are all these grab bag of different pressures, uh, units that you'll see. Um, but only Pascal's is uh, SI, okay? So we'll stick to that. So let's talk a little bit about pressure, first of all, before I do anything else with it. Why is it useful? Why not just talk in terms of force? Why force per area? What's the usefulness of grouping those two together? Um, I'll give you one example, just briefly. a little bit morbid, but hopefully get the point across. Let's compare a syringe to a punch, okay? So, someone comes and gives you a light tap on the shoulder, a punch, right? Okay? Exerts a certain amount of force. Someone puts, with that same amount of force, a syringe to your skin. Same force. So, obviously very different things happen, right? It's not because of the force, it's because the area over which that force is applied. The syringe is applied a very small area, and therefore exerts very large pressure. And it turns out that your skin has a characteristic breaking pressure, not a breaking force, but a characteristic breaking pressure. And the syringe easily, easily exceeds it. Whereas a punch is, of course, applied over a much larger area, and the pressure it's smaller, and the punch doesn't usually go through your skin, right? Maybe some old kung fu movies, you see that, right? Punch right through somebody, but in real life, it doesn't actually work, okay? So your skin has a certain characteristic breaking pressure, not a breaking force, but a characteristic pressure, okay? So, um, one of the first things we should do, um, that's kind of the end of the, the basics, I guess, um, introducing density and pressure. Um, let's go ahead and um, look at how we might apply these ideas to some systems. So, um, are there any questions before I, I start doing that? Okay, so. So. Let's imagine that you um, have a um, soda container. Uh, you take it up uh, with you on a flight. And you have yourself a nice, refreshing uh, drink uh, in flight. And then you <laughs> empty the bottle, OK? The bottle's empty. I'm going to not try to draw a bottle, but I'm going to try to I'm going to draw it as a box, okay, because I can't draw, okay? And so, um, the, uh, when you close it back up, you are sealing in the pressure up at that altitude, right? So, the pressure up there is less, and let's say you seal it back up, like this, and then you come back down, the plane lands, and now you're back to the sea level atmospheric pressure. So now you have a pressure differential between the inside and the outside. And if you have a strong seal, 
then that the air can't equalize. So what's going to happen? It's going to get crushed, right? Okay. And by the way, that same process is why your ears hurt when you land because of your eardrum. You've sealed in that lower pressure inside and you come back down and there's a larger pressure outside, right? So, let's talk about the forces involved. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take my equation, P equals F over A, and I'm going to solve for the force. The amount of force, so that's P times A. But while these are just magnitudes, we of course know that force is a vector. It has a direction, so let's talk about that. So this is a force due to a pressure. And the size of it is F equals P times A. But let's address the direction. So like most forces, we want a rule of thumb for size and for direction. And here is my rule of thumb. Uh, the force acts such that the uh, material causing the pressure wants to increase its volume. It wants to occupy a larger space than it already is. And if it can't, it instead exerts a force in that direction. So let me give you an example. The gas particles of this gas inside, they fly around, and when they fly around, they of course end up trying to go outward, and because they hit the wall, they're going to rebound, right? So there's a force inward from the wall which corrals them and makes them not pass out, right? That, we could call it the normal force if you want to. But the point being is that when those things are denied, they have to be pushed inward by the wall to get them to turn around. And Newton's third law tells us that there's a reaction force. So if the wall pushes the gas particle back in, then the wall gets pushed outward, right? So there will be a force, let me label these, this is P1, P2. So there will be a force outward on the container like this. Oops, why did I label that one up too? I'm not there yet. Okay. So you can see that the force is in the direction of how the material inside would increase its volume. Now you might say, why didn't I just say outward force? Well, it's not always outward. In this case, it's outward because wanting to occupy more space than it is already, it wants to go outward. But the same can be said of the air molecules that are outside, right? These air molecules outside, let me do these in a different color just so that maybe these are be a little more straightforward. Now, these have the rest of the world to go in, but the one place that they're denied from is going into the box, right? So when they hit this thing, they collide and rebound. They get turned around, and there will be an equal and opposite force inward on the walls of the container. So there'll be an F2. So the air on the outside wants to increase its volume by going inward, inward into the box. Just like the air on the inside wants to increase its volume by getting out. So this could result in an inward or outward force. It really just depends on where you, it is that you could go to occupy more space than you do currently, right? So it's not that the force is always inward. It's not that it's always outward. It's always such as that you want to go somewhere where there's more space for you to move in. And if you can't, and you have to get rebuffed and turned around by hitting some kind of barrier, that imparts some kind of force on the barrier. So, what we have here is a competition between the inward force of the gas outside wanting to get in 
and the outward force for the gas inside that wants to get out, and of course, they, there may not necessarily be an equal amount uh, of competition. So for instance, if we pick, say, a side of this, let's say that this lid here has an area A on the inside and the outside, if we wanted to know the net force on the lid, we would, of course, we might pick an axis or something like that. Let's say maybe that's the plus y direction. We'd have that the force one acts upward and force two acts downward. So we take their difference, right? So I put in the formula twice and then factor out because of course the area is common. The, they both are pushing um, against the same area. So I'll call that, just generically speaking, the force from a pressure difference. So whichever one is bigger, of course, that's the one that wins. Okay. So, for instance, in this eardrum's case, um, which way is going to be the direction of the net force? Inward, right? This one's going to win. That'll be the F net from the pressure difference, right? They both try to occupy more space, but the one outside wants it more, right? Same thing here. Is this, which one's going to dominate, the inward or the outward? Which one? Well, this, this puts pressure is bigger, so it's going to, the inward force is going to win, right? It's going to get crushed. Has anyone ever experienced this, by the way? Maybe driving between different elevations, you see things either blow up or get crushed accordingly. Yeah. So another thing you can do here, you can buy a, buy a bag of potato chips and then drive up to the mountains and it just goes, it puffs out, right? Because it's the sea level pressure that's inside and then it pushes against the, it successfully pushes against the lower pressure up in the mountains, right? You can sometimes maybe even get your bag to pop. Although, Usually they try to make them strong enough for, so that you know, if you're not one of these truck drivers that's delivering potato chips, you go up over a mountain pass and everything pops, right? Okay. So um, this equation right here is in some way going to inform most of the rest of the, the uh, unit on fluids. And the thing that I want you to remember is that if you have two competing pressures, the force always points from the higher pressure to the lower pressure because that's the one that wins, right? So the force points towards the lower pressure, okay? So if you have two competing pressures, well, then, um, the higher pressure wins, and the lower pressure is going to have to uh, uh, kind of uh, lose, right? So the force points towards lower pressure basically because the higher pressure won. So we're going to flip this every single which way. We're going to use it immediately to find some important formulas that will do it with force. And then, of course, we know that everything that can be done with the force method can be kind of flipped around and talked about in terms of energy. So we'll talk about energy method with fluids as well. So let's take this idea and apply it to something that we might be interested in, which is to find the pressure at a certain specified depth underneath some water. Right? Maybe you want to know how much does the pressure change as you go deeper. Let's say you're at a depth D below the surface and you want to know the pressure, how much you do that. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take this water, and of course water is hard to work with, because where does it end, where does it begin? So we're going to take a column of water whose surface, whose uh, where the top of the uh, water is at the surface, 
At the bottom, oops, this came out weird. And the bottom is that's the um, depth of interest. So when water is kind of uh, has no beginning and no end, we have to pick a certain group of water to analyze. So we actually have an object to look at. So again, it's a column of water. Its surface is at uh, it, the top of the water is at the surface. The bottom is at the point of interest. So this is a rectangular box of depth B. And the top and bottom areas are going to be A. So let's analyze. First of all, a box of water has weight. Okay? If you dropped a box of water out the window, it would fall down. It would be in free fall. And yet, when it's in a lake or something with other water, it doesn't. It just stays in place. Well, how is that? It's because, apparently, the force from the surrounding fluid has to hold it up. So it gets support from the water around it. Does that make sense? So we just simply conclude that the force from the surrounding fluid, not itself, it doesn't hold itself up, but the fluid around it, holds up the weight of this box of water. Well, the only way that you could have a upward force, remember what we said is that the force points towards lower pressure from the fluid. Well, that must mean that the pressure down here is larger and the pressure here is smaller. So the force from the fluid points from the higher pressure toward the lower pressure. And so hopefully it's not surprising, you probably already know this, is that the water pressure increases with depth. Okay? That's because the water below has to hold up the water above. Alright, let's put it in. Um, I'll take my formula, that's the pressure at my depth. Let me subtract it in the order that will give a positive value. So I subtract a higher minus lower pressure because I just want to amount and don't want to deal with any negatives at this point. Um, and that's pretty much it. Now it's just about a matter of rearrangement. Okay. Um, first of all, what is the mass of this box? Well, here we use uh, this equation arranged for mass. This, by the way, we often use because, of course, we have mass in lots of our previous equations. Now we have a new substitution for it, density times volume. Now the volume of a box, right? Length times width times height? Yes? Except for the length and width are already combined into what we call the area. So let's put in area times height, which is the depth. Oh, and this is the density of the fluid. I should maybe give it a little subscript. So let's put that in. Let's see what happens. Density of the fluid times A times D times G. And we have the area cancels. And then we solve for P. Here's our equation. This is the equation for how much is the pressure at some depth. Now let me point out that the area canceled which is nice because that was just an arbitrary box of water, right? In a bigger body of water. So there shouldn't be any artifact left of that, which was just a tool for solving, right? The only things that remain in the equation are things that can be said about the fluid as a whole. What is its density? For 
forgot the F here. And how deep are you within it? That's the only thing that matters. You probably know that whether you're diving down uh, one meter into a swimming pool or a gigantic lake, the pressure is the same. It doesn't matter how wide the body of water is. That, that doesn't matter, right? You've never had the thought, oh, that lake's too big. The pressure's going to be different when I dive in. It's nothing to do with that. So the area doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is as your depth increases, your pressure will increase. And you probably know that too. When you go deeper, there's more pressure. Notice that the pressure is driven by gravity. The pressure increases because gravity pulls down on water, and the more deep you get into the body of water, the more water you, is above you that you have to hold up. So the pressure increases. If you were somewhere where there was no gravity, if there was a gigantic blob of water in deep space, there would be no pressure change. You could swim into the middle of it, and the pressure would be the same. Okay? The pressure is driven by the fact that the fluid has to hold up the water above it. The fluid has to support itself against gravity. Um, the, uh, the other feature I did want to point out about this equation is that it's expressed in this kind of way. That P we call the total hydrostatic pressure. Hydro means water, static means not moving, so hopefully that's obvious, hydrostatic pressure. But the pressure is expressed as atmospheric pressure plus some stuff, right? So if we put a depth of zero, the formula gives what? If we put in D equals zero, we get... Right, makes sense, right? You're at the surface. What, what's the pressure? Not zero, atmospheric pressure. That's what your starting point, right? Before you ever jump in, it's atmospheric pressure. Now, if you were, say, a scuba diver, um, why would you want your pressure gauge that you're going to jump in with, why would you want it to read 100,000 pascals when you're on the beach or whatever and you haven't done anything? Why does it need to say 100,000? That's alarming, isn't it? I mean, that's just your normal pressure that you live at. But why do you need it to say that? Right? That's like the everything is okay alarm, right? It just go, kind of goes off while everything's okay. So instead, this is really the part that you're interested in, right? It's how much more is your pressure than your baseline, what you're used to. This part of the pressure gets its own name. And in fact, this is a very common way of expressing pressure is total pressure is some baseline, usually atmospheric pressure, and then this is called the gauge pressure. It's the modification to the pressure from what you're used to. So gauge pressure is a way to, to, to talk about pressure in terms of a modification on top of your atmospheric pressure. So for instance, if you had a pressure gauge as a scuba diver, why not have it say zero while you're, before you jump into the water, right? Because you really only are interested in is how much more is the pressure than where you normally are, right? Does that make sense? So in this case, this is the gauge pressure. And of course, in this case, it's always going to be positive because, of course, you're always adding on top of the atmospheric pressure. When you jump in, your pressure is only going to increase. So when it has positive gauge pressure, what it simply means is that the total pressure is exceeding atmospheric. Now, when you hear this in biology and chemistry, they get a little sloppy. They don't say gauge pressure. They just say positive pressure. So oftentimes, you have a room which is set at positive pressure. What does that mean? It means that that room has a higher pressure than the atmospheric pressure outside. Um, does anyone uh, know what that might be useful for? 
if you have a room which has positive pressure or positive gauge pressure, like a, a medical use or biological use, That maybe I have no idea. Um, that's more esoteric than I know. What if someone has an immune disorder, right? And you're really concerned about bugs getting in from the hallway or from the outside, right? You put them in a positive pressure room because then stuff can usually get out of that room, but can't get in as easily, right? Because the pressure pushes out of that room. Right, so if someone has a compromised immune system, that might be a good place to put them. Um, you can also have negative gauge pressure, or they sometimes just call it negative pressure. Now, there's no such thing as truly negative pressure. Pressure is a scalar, it's a number, it's an amount. Negative doesn't make any sense for P total. P total is always positive. But negative gauge pressure simply means that your, your total pressure, which is positive, is just smaller than atmospheric pressure, okay? So it's just, the gauge, because the gauge is a modification on the pressure that you already have. So if you have a negative gauge pressure, it just simply means you're taking away from atmospheric pressure. Can anyone think of a reason why you might want to put someone in a negative pressure room? Uh, uh, or maybe what they have you don't want to get out. Like if you have Ebola, right? So you do not want that to get out of the room. So you want that stuff can maybe get from the hallway into the room, but stuff can't get from the room out into the hallway. So that might be a reason why you want to put someone in a negative pressure room. And again, it's just negative gauge pressure, okay? So these are things that hospitals are equipped to do. They're equipped to have rooms that are both at a higher or lower pressure than the regular atmospheric pressure, okay? So that's something that you should be aware of is commonly done in talking about pressure, okay? It's talking about gauge pressure, which is a modification on top of the atmospheric pressure. That can be plus or minus. It simply means your pressure is more or less than atmospheric. But total pressure, it makes no sense for it to not be positive. So when you hear talking, people talking about positive and negative pressure, they mean gauge pressure. Okay? In our case, our gauge is always positive, right? Because you can only go to a bigger pressure by going deeper, right? So you probably have had this experience uh, if you've ever dived down into a pool. You ever have, you go deep enough? What happens with your ears? They, it's not pleasant, right? It hurts. So what you have is this situation where you have a larger pressure outside, but you, of course, have atmospheric pressure trapped inside. So which way, again, does the force push? It pushes inward. I know that the pain when you dive down maybe 10, 15 feet is already not really exciting. You might wonder, how is it that scuba divers can dive down 60, 70, 80, 100 feet without being in immense pain or even their eardrums exploding? They don't wear any ear protection, but they do have access to something that you don't when you're holding your breath. They have access to taking in air from their breather. So what do they do? They breathe in some air, and then, instead of exhaling it out, they close their mouth, close their nose, and exhale up from their lungs, up through their sinuses, up through, the, their sinuses do link your inner ear through something called the eustachian tube, and they can actually, basically, exhale into their inner ear. And if that pressure increases, well now, if these two pressures are the same, what happens to the force on your eardrum? goes to zero. So this is a process called equalization. So they can do that, but you can't really because you're trying to hold in your air. You're not trying to waste any blowing it up in your sinuses. You can use this technique, however, when you are landing on an aircraft. So if you have had a lower pressure locked into inside your ear from a long flight at elevation, 
you're coming back down and landing, you can try it. So what you do, close your mouth, pinch off your nose and very, very gently exhale in uh, through up through your head and you can feel something in your ears. Do it gently, okay? Sometimes your eustachian tubes get blocked. One things you can do to kind of unblock them is kind of move your jaw around or things like that. Oftentimes when you yawn, it also helps. So these are all these kind of common tricks to getting your ears to pop, so to speak. Don't do it if you have any kind of cold, any kind of phlegm or mucus in your sinuses because you do not want to be inadvertently pushing that stuff into your inner ear, okay? You do not want potentially uh, bacteria-borne stuff in your ear because that's a bad place to have it, okay? They say also for scuba diving, don't ever try to go scuba diving. You have to be able to equalize, so do not go when you're congested. Okay. I made the mistake of saying, saying I tried scuba diving. Oh, okay, I'm not that congested. I managed to equalize all right, but I must have pushed some nasty stuff into my inner ear because a week later I got an infection and I burst my eardrum. And it, if you've ever had that happen, it's excruciatingly painful. Okay. So that's a little bit about the process of equalization. Because even if this pressure is high, if this pressure is high as well, then you don't feel any pain. Um, okay, so the other thing I did want to mention about this was the difference between density and pressure. So I want to contrast those two things. So pressure versus density. When you go down, the pressure increases. Okay. However, the density does not. So you can go down and you find that there's an immense pressure increase as you go down to the ocean, but the pressure, uh, the density doesn't really. Now, let me talk about how that makes sense. Let's take, instead of two water molecules, let's take my two fists, okay? I'll put them together like this gently. Now I can certainly increase the pressure, right? There's more force acting on per area on each other. That's what's happening to the water molecules as you go deeper. But am I changing the density of my fists? No, right? Can I really take my fists and push so hard that I merge them into one fist, one big fist? No, I'm not changing the density. So it turns out that water molecules, the arrangement, they like it so much that even if you exert a tremendous amount of increased pressure, they're not really going to change their spacing appreciably. So even as you go deeper and the pressure increases, the density stays about the same. This is not true if you have something where the density is more negotiable. So this is a liquid, of course, which is highly resistant to compression. But if you go over here to the air of our planet, that, of course, is not a liquid, it's a gas. And so as you go from zero pressure out in space, and you increase the pressure down to atmospheric pressure at sea level, then the air does compress. Okay? So as there's more pressure, there's a lot of empty space in a gas, so the density can change. So here, not only does the pressure increase, but also you do increase the density. So you will find that the air is more dense at sea level than it is higher up. But that, of course, comes from the fact that air is compressible. So that makes our life very difficult. And the equation we just found would not apply. The equation we just found assumes that there is a certain density that we can count on, right? So this is only for liquids. The density changes, is, the density stays the same while the pressure can increase, okay? Have any questions on that? Okay, so that's your pressure formula for a total uh, hydrostatic pressure. This part of it is called the gauge pressure. Um, it, this equation assumes that the density of the stuff does not change while the pressure can change. 
Uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to move into um, something called buoyant force. Or buoyancy in general. This, by the way, is going to be your lab next week. So the, this is, I forget what it's called. It's a buoyancy lab or buoyant force lab or possibly Archimedes principle. Um, but it's the only lab in your manual that's on fluids. I'm going to give you, try to give you a quick uh, three or four minute introduction on it. And then we'll, of course, continue with it significantly next time. Um, so here's the thing. We already know that if you have a box of water, the reason why that box does not fall down is because it has a force on it. There's a force from the surrounding fluid. Now, let's suppose we quickly could pull that box of water out and replace it with an object that's exactly the same size. Well, the surrounding fluid does the same job that it always does, so now you get a support force from the liquid around you. Okay? Now in this context, we call the force of support from the fluid a buoyant force. We'll just abbreviate it as B. Now how much support force do you get? Well, remember that the whole job of the fluid was to support fluid if it were there. So it's the weight of the fluid that you displaced, right? That's the job that it has to do. So how much force do you get from the surrounding fluid? Well, as much as fluid moved out of the way. This is called Archimedes principle. And it is quite a clever thing to realize it actually applies regardless of the shape of the object. Even if you have a crazy shaped object, which is not a box, the point being is that if that object replaced water, well, water in that space would have been exactly supported, and the surrounding water doesn't know the difference, so it's going to support that much as well. Okay? So Archimedes. He's, this is going real, really far back. This is going to BC times. He figured this out. Um, that does not necessarily mean that this object will stay in place. Because remember, the surrounding water just has to hold up water if, if it were there. But you could have replaced it with something that's heavier than the water it replaced. So maybe the object has a larger weight than that. If that's the case, what's going to happen to this object? going to sink. That's right. So it sinks if the buoyant force is not actually as big as the weight of the object. What's the only way that that object could be more massive even though it's the same uh, size? Not hollow. If it was more dense, exactly. So it's going to sink if the object is more dense than the fluid it's in. Because remember, they have the same volume, but the object has more mass. So it's going to turn out that we can predict whether something will sink or float by looking at its density. So we'll pick that up on Friday's lecture.